If you don't know the minor scale, you've got a major problem. I'm Uncle Ben, and this is why you suck at guitar. Hey there, kids. It's your good buddy, Uncle Ben, reporting to you from a dark and stormy day here in Tennessee. But that's not the delicate pitter-patter of raindrops you're hearing. That's the sound of Gary Moore's tears falling to earth from Valhalla, because you don't know shit about the minor scale. But lucky for you and Gary's immortal soul, we're going to fix that problem by learning the five best ways to play the minor scale. Last year I uploaded This Is Why You Suck At Guitar 18, You Don't Know The Major Scale, in which we talked about the best ways to play that one, and ever since then I've gotten a ton of comments, carrier pigeons, and telepathic messages from you guys asking for a breakdown on the minor scale to go along with it. If you haven't watched the major scale video yet, I highly recommend that you do. I'll put a link to it in the video description below. Reason being is because the minor scale and the major scale are kind of like two sides of the same coin. They're the, the yin and the yang, the captain and tennille of music. Towards the end of the video, I'm going to show you guys how to apply both major and minor scale patterns together to form a complete fretboard map that's super easy to see. All of the charts, diagrams, and backing tracks I'm going to use in this video are available to everybody who supports my channel over on patreon.com slash benellerguitars, the coolest place on the whole internet. Become a supporter over there even at just the $1 a month level and you'll also get access to all kinds of downloadable tabs, backing tracks, bonus lessons, and so much more. I'll also be uploading a very special Patreon-only bonus lesson to go along with this and showing you guys the best way to use these scale patterns while you're soloing. We're going to show you guys how to play super melodically and target chord tones like a boss, so be sure to check that video out. All the other kids are doing it, so you might as well too. So don't delay. Join today. Let's kick it off with the deceptively simple and supremely enlightening linear form. <laughs> From my experience, whenever you're trying to learn any new scale, the best way to do it is to break it down into a left to right one string pattern. Whenever you're trying to learn a scale and really understand it, you've got to learn its pattern of steps and half steps. And most of the time, the huge vertical patterns that we learn on the guitar first can do a lot to sort of mask that and keep us from really learning what's going on inside of that scale. But whenever we play the minor scale linear across a single string, it's super easy to see what's going on inside of it. For most of the examples in this video, I'm going to be using A as the root note, because that's the key of Van Halen. But by all means, take all the concepts that we're talking about and apply them to different root notes as well. I'll show you more on that as we go. To play the minor scale, play this series of steps and half steps. So start off on your root, go up one whole step, half step, whole step, Whole step. After this, we're going to play a half, a step, and then one more whole step. So the entire sequence is root, step, half, step, step, half, step, step. Now, after that last whole step that you did, you've ended up back at the note A again, the same note that you began on. So you've got to understand that a scale is like a circle or a racetrack, you know? As soon as you finish lap one and cross the finish line, lap two begins again. So technically after you play that series, root, step, half, step, step, half, step, step, you're back at the root note again and can just restart the entire sequence. Root, step, half, step, step, half, step, and then I'm out of frets. But it could go on for infinity, just repeating that step pattern, reaching a root, repeating it again, and so on. And after you've learned that one step pattern, you've learned the step pattern for every other minor scale. So let's say that we we're playing a different one, like say an E minor scale, right? Playing in the key of Metallica now. Let's start off here on an E note. I'll do the fifth fret on my second string. Now, we could play that exact same series. Root, step, half, step, step, half, step, step, and we're back at an E root note again. You'll notice that as you begin to trust that step pattern, you stop thinking about fretboard numbers. Like for that A minor, we didn't describe it as two, four, five, seven, nine, or whatever. I've been down that road of trying to memorize scales as sequences of fretboard numbers like that, and it only leads to pain and misery. So trust me when I say that Fred Gwynn had it right in Pet Cemetery when he said, don't go down that road. One string scale patterns are also great ways to put your hand synchronization to the test and bust out your favorite licks by super shredders like Yahweh Mouse Meat. 
And so can you. So now that you got the one string thing under control, let's take it a step further by learning the good old fashioned standard form. So this is actually the first way that I ever learned how to play the minor scale and I still use this shape all the time because it's nice and boxy and easy to visualize and it doesn't require any big stretches. So it's comfy to play no matter where you are on the neck. Whenever I play these big boxy scale patterns like this, I tend to think of them more in terms of the fingering numbers than I do the actual frets or steps or half steps or whatever. You'll notice on the scale chart over there that I included two little ghost notes past the root on the high E string. This one and this one. It's really easy to understand. You've got two E strings on your guitar, right? Big brother, little brother. Well, in any scale pattern that you learn, not just for the minor scale, in any scale pattern that you learn, if Big Brother does it, that's essentially like giving Little Brother permission to do the exact same thing. So anything that you do on the low E, you can also mirror and do on the high E as well. You'll also notice on that scale chart right there that I have the root notes of the scale colored in. And you'll notice that those occur once every seven notes. Root, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root, two, three, four, five, six, seven root, two, three. It's really important to understand where the root notes of any scale pattern are. A lot of times guitar players just think of the root note as being the very first note in the pattern, but you gotta remember that scale is like a circle, right? As soon as we pass the finish line, we start the next lap again. And those root notes are gonna be really valuable while you're soloing, because if you're playing an A minor scale over an A minor chord, you can damn well bet that it loves to hear the sound of its root note A being played in any octave against it. Lots more about that in the Patreon exclusive video. And even though the scale pattern might look and feel a whole lot different than the linear one that we started off with, it is still taking you through the exact same series of steps and half steps. And in fact, every scale pattern that we're gonna talk about today is merely a different way to express root, step, half, step, step, half, step, step. That is the language of the minor scale. Now another thing that everybody should understand about scale patterns on the guitar is that whatever you learn in one position can be repeated 12 frets higher for an octave up clone of the exact same set of notes. So whenever you learn that pattern that we just talked about, you actually learned two different kind of islands of information. Your low octave A minor, and then 12 frets above that on fret number 17, you can play the high octave A minor. Double the pleasure, double the fun. But well, Uncle Ben, now I have this scale pattern and this scale pattern and nothing to connect them. Ah yes, the classic guitar player crisis where you know one scale pattern down here, another scale pattern up here, and you end up with this kind of no man's land in between them. The dreaded scale pattern baldness. Remember how I mentioned how important it is to find the root notes in any scale pattern? Well, the cool thing is, is if you can locate one of those root notes, you can then transition into that linear mode, play up that string until you reach your other scale pattern up here and walk it down. Root two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root. Now that we found a root note, let's transition into step pattern mode, okay? Root, step, half. Step, step, half step, step. We're back at the root note again, up here at the 17th position where you can play down your good old high A minor scale. Now you're making fretboard maps like a modern day Ptolemy. And one more thing about the scale pattern that is extremely handy and useful to know, it's really easy to see how your common minor pentatonic shape is there hiding out inside of this standard form minor scale. Anytime you're using the minor scale, you can also use the minor pentatonic because the minor pentatonic is essentially just that minor scale just with a couple of holes poked out of it, you know? We kick out the second and sixth notes and it leaves you with the minor pentatonic. So anytime you're using that minor scale, feel free to go in and out of regular minor pentatonic too. It worked for Randy Rhodes and so can you. Now let's get on to scale pattern number three, which was a huge game changer for me. The extremely handy pocket octave shapes.
These little scale shapes might not look like much, but as soon as I started incorporating them into my play, it drastically changed the way that I could visualize the fretboard, the way I could improvise, and also just my knowledge of the notes across the neck too, because when you use these, you're not gonna be using your low E string for the root note all the time. These shapes are also great for players that like to play in drop tunings, you know, because if your low E string is tuned down a whole step, you can't very well use that to root out scale patterns and stuff without some serious modification. So if you're a player that likes drop tunings, I recommend learning these pocket octave shapes as well as you can. It's a simple, easy to see shape that we can root out from any string. Let's start off here on the low E string fret five on that A note. It's simply one octave of that minor scale. Now if we take that same idea and start it on a different A note, like let's say the 12th fret on the A string. We can use that exact same shape. Just visualize it just like you did down here, only start it on the 12th A. Let's say we took that scale shape and started it off from the A note that we find on the seventh fret D. It starts off sounding just fine. But the second that we cross over the B string, everything goes to sh and that's because the tuning of the guitar is kind of stupid. Okay, so here's where things get a little bit tricky, but it's worth it, so stick with me here. So all the other string sets on your guitar are tuned a fourth apart, intervallically speaking. E, A, right? E, F, G, A, it's a fourth. A to D, A, B, C, D. D to G, D, E, F, G. G to B, G, A, B, third. B to E though, B, C, D, E, back to being fourths again. That random third that we have that occurs when we go from the G string to the B string means that any shape that crosses over the B string must be, as Delbert Grady once said in The Shining, corrected. Okay, so let's check out how this would work. Let's start off here on the seventh fret D string and think about that picture of that scale just as it occurred on the other string sets that didn't make us cross over the B, right? We're gonna start off playing it just like normal. But instead of playing straight down right here on the B, again, it has to be corrected. So just shift your hand up one fret and play it just like it was. Again, any shape that crosses over the B string has to be fixed by moving up a half step. It's as easy as that. Let's take a look at how this scale pattern correction thing has to happen when we start the scale pattern off from the G string fret two from that A note. Now again, the picture as we learned it would look like this. Kind of puts us in that dangerous turf of accidental holds worth again. Okay, so again, we're gonna visualize that shape as we learned it, starting here from the second fret on the G string, one, three, four. When we reach the B, it has to be fixed. So we're automatically gonna move up a fret to play that next one, three, four shape. So they're no longer stacked on top of each other like they were here. They've gotta be scooted up a fret when they reach the B string. Now after that, it's business as usual. You don't need to like unfix it or fix it again by moving up another fret or whatever. All the work is done whenever we cross over the B string and move up a fret. So you don't need to make any other alterations when you continue a shape onto the high E. And also too, if you found the 10th fret B string A note, that's enough of a runway to play six of the notes of the scale, right? That might not seem like much, but that's almost a complete octave. And the cool thing is, is if you know that step pattern from there, you can keep going and complete the octave. Root, step, half, step, step, half, step, step, I'm back at the root again. These tiny pocket octave shapes are extremely useful, especially if you're playing over a piece of music that features some unusual key or chord changes. So let's say I was playing over some sort of super grim and cult black metal style chord progression. Maybe something really nasty that goes from, let's say, F minor to B minor. Now if I'm soloing against that, I'm gonna be using the F minor scale against the F minor chord and the B minor scale against the B minor chord. And if you're the kind of guitar player that only knows how to root out scale shapes from the low E string, you're going to be severely f***ed here because you're gonna be constantly shifting from this position to this position. But if you know your pocket octave shapes and know where to find the root notes form really well, you'll have no problem with this because you can play F minor from this F note, B minor off of this B. There's an F note that I can find right here. Had to fix the pattern right there, of course. Then I can find maybe a B minor off of this B note. 
F minor off of this F, and so on. Allow me to demonstrate. Another thing that I really like about these pocket octave shapes is that they're really easy to connect and form massive sprawling scale patterns. Okay, check it out. What if you started off from the low E string shape? Now that note that we landed on right there, that's another root note, right? So that's a viable place to start this scale pattern again. So now I've played, connect it to this one. What do you know, I've landed on another A note right there. What if I start the pattern off and complete it? Now I've covered one, two, three, four octaves and I've really only thought about like one scale pattern. Pretty cool stuff. And making an active effort to find root notes for these scale patterns on whatever string set you might happen to be on at that time, not just always thinking about starting scales on the low E, that's really going to help you learn the fretboard that much better. So now you could even do something as crazy as starting off with a standard form scale pattern. Go into pocket octaves. And then from there thinking about the linear step pattern. Root, step, half, step, step, half, step, root. And now you're getting that fretboard smothered and covered in shred sauce. Pattern number four is the favorite pattern of Shreddy Kruger. Three notes per string. I love my three note per string scale patterns because they cover a lot of sonic territory and they got a bunch of notes happening on every string, which is great for those Paul Gilbert sequence licks or some sexy Satriani legato. You'll notice the fingering that I use here is one, three, four, one, three, four. And then when it goes to these big wide stretches here, I play one, two, four. I point this out because most of the time whenever I show this shape to beginners, they want to play the first two notes of that big wide sequence there with their first and third fingers, which leaves their fourth finger making a really big uncomfortable stretch. Anatomically speaking, your third and fourth fingers are connected upwards in your arm, so it's much harder to move them independently of each other and stretch them far apart. To demonstrate, make a peace sign with these two fingers then make a peace sign with these two fingers and tell me which one's easier. If doing those kinds of stretches down here in the fifth position is too much for you, I recommend just taking them up higher on the neck, you know? Play a D minor scale by starting off here on D. None of those stretches aren't quite so bad. You could practice taking that scale pattern down a fret at a time until you feel a little bit more comfortable down here in this position. Now exactly like I've pointed out about the other shapes, you're going to be encountering a root note every seven notes here. Be sure to be aware of that. Root two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root two, three, four, five, six, seven. Root two, three, four. I notice a lot of times whenever beginners learn scale patterns like this, they tend to play licks that kind of terminate in the highest note in a scale pattern, right? Regardless of what it is. And it makes sense. It's the highest note in the scale pattern. It seems significant, like you're crossing a finish line or something. But depending on what chord you happen to be playing over at the time, that note might be pretty worthless. Allow me to demonstrate with a little help from my assistant, G-O-D. Hey, if you're not doing anything, give me an A minor. It's kind of a little, you know, tinkly, arpeggiating thing. Wow, that's got beautiful. So everything was sounding all smooth and sexy up until that very last note, right? It's kind of like the audio equivalent of looking at a picture that's hanging on the wall like this. You just want to move it until it's right. The sound that you were hearing right there is the sound of me landing on a note that wasn't in the chord. Again, what's in an A minor chord, right? A, C, E. This note is D. That's not in the chord. I would have been a lot better off instead driving back towards one of the other notes in the scale that's in that chord, like this C note, this A note, or maybe even this E note right here. 
This mindset leads to a malarkey-free practice strategy I call no joyriding. Whenever you're practicing a scale, right, instead of just taking it up to its highest note and calling it quits, always walk it back at least to a root note, you know? I ended that there on that A note that was on the B string. I'm always driving the car towards something. Because of the uniform number of notes per string in this pattern, it becomes really easy to come up with a cool sounding sequence or pattern that sounds great on a single string, and then simply copy and paste that onto the next string of the pattern, and the next one, and so on, for super shredder licks. Instead of simply playing up the three notes on each string once, what if you played up each string twice for a total of six notes per string? Copy paste onto the next string. They also sound a lot cooler than simply playing up and down a scale pattern in the middle of your solo. Good old Joe Satriani uses those three note per string patterns a lot too because there's so much room for hammer-ons and pull-offs to get that sexy liquid legato action happening. And lastly, the final stop on your quest for shred supremacy, four notes per string. Right there is just a big old boy of a scale pattern and as the name implies there are four notes happening on every string. You'll notice that whenever I played it a second ago I played the first three notes like I was playing a three note per string scale. Then I shifted up here off of my fourth finger to grab the fourth note on every string. One, two, three, shift. One, two, three, shift and so on. You'll also notice that a lot of the true shred monsters of the world like Rusty Cooley like to play these shapes with one finger per note regardless of the pattern like this. Well, I would rearrange those four notes that occur on every string to feel more like two groups of three, okay? So I could take a look at the first three notes that happen here on the E string. Maybe do one of those Paul Gilbert six kind of ideas. And then what I would think about is the next three notes that happen on that string. So it's kind of like I'm taking a look at that four note pattern, you know, that's on there and looking at it as these three notes and these three notes that I can play sixes across. And I could keep that idea going on all the other strings too. Three, 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 three. Always driving it towards a root note. Again, no joy riding through scale patterns. That's a super hot lick that really only lives inside of that scale pattern, you know? I find that if I try to play that exact same phrasing through like, let's say the three note per string scale pattern, it would be 10 times harder. Cause I'd be playing something like this. It'd be impossible to do at that kind of speed. But whenever you phrase it with that four note per string shape, it suddenly becomes doable. Sometimes I'll also use that sort of three plus three nature of these four note per string scale patterns to come up with some really cool Joe Satriani style legato licks like that. So let's say you had these three notes on the G, then you could slide down to the fourth note, right? Hammer back up if you want to. Do that same idea on the next string. You gotta be slipping and sliding all over that fretboard like it was a god dang crocodile mile. So there you go guys, the five best ways to play the minor scale. They are as follows. One string linear. The standard form. The handy pocket octaves. Three notes per string and the massive four note per string shape. And keep in mind that all of these ideas are movable to any key. They're not just good for, you know, A minor. If you're playing in F minor, just simply take all the concepts that we talked about and make them start off on F notes. 
If you're playing in B flat minor, put them on B flats and so forth. Really one of the best things that you can do to help yourself learn how to use these things all over the neck is to simply, you know, pick a key. Like let's say B minor. Go here on YouTube and type in B minor backing track or B Aeolian backing track if you're fancy pants. Those are two names for the same scale. You know, you'll find like a million different backing tracks and all kinds of different styles and tempos and stuff. Just put one on that sounds cool to you and make a deliberate effort to improvise and solo using all of these different ideas. Find a single B note, play linear, find all your little pocket octave shapes, three notes per string, whatever works. And that's gonna be the best way to make these a part of your everyday musical vocabulary. And if you wanna get even more mileage out of the stuff that you've picked up from this video, as well as this is why you suck 18, you don't know the major scale, check out this little tip. You can take any of those different forms for the major scale that you learned in that video, the pocket octave, the standard form, whatever, and simply place them three frets above whatever minor scale you're using. So for example, all the stuff that we talked about in today's video is based around A minor, right? Take all the major scale stuff you learned in the other video and put it three frets higher. So you're playing C major patterns. A minor, C major. Don't really think of it though as being like a different scale or a different musical language or whatever. Because what you'll find is if you look at the notes of A minor and C major, you'll notice that they're the exact same thing, just in a different order. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, A. Well, the C major pattern is just C, D, E, F, G, A, B, C. It's the exact same notes, just in a different order. I gotta bug you one more time. I have one more thing I need to show them. Thank you. Okay, A minor. C major. Didn't sound like a different scale, right? It's because it's the same notes, it's just in a different order is all. You can also reverse the logic there and say for all of the major scale patterns that you learned in the other video, you can play a minor scale pattern three frets below it and it's gonna generate the exact same notes. So if you're playing a song that's in the key of D major, you know, you could use all of your B minor patterns, again, three frets down. You could use all your B minor scale patterns and it's the exact same set of notes. It's just in a different order. So if you take the stuff that you learned in this video and then move up three frets and combine it with everything you learned in the major scale video, you're gonna be dominating the neck in no time. Thank you guys as always for watching. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for new content coming at you every single week. And ring the bell for notifications every time I upload a new slice of fried gold. If you guys wanna help support my channel and learn even more about how to use these scale patterns, be sure to sign up for my Patreon page today at patreon.com slash benellerguitars. And be sure to let me know in the comments section what you'd like to see featured on a future installment of This Is Why You Suck at Guitar. Thanks as always for watching. Now get away from the computer, pick up your guitar, and play nice. Less clicking, more picking. That was, that was a dog sneeze. Wow.